Um, but this will be actually part three of a, a series that I began, and I took a little break from the last time I was here, and we talked about Jesus as the good shepherd and the one who cares for us, and uh, Moses as he went to shepherd school and learned to lead God's way. But we're going to jump back into the series that I, I started and then took a break from. But uh, let's pray and commit the hour to the Lord. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your love. I thank you that you are the God who has demonstrated your greatness and your trustworthiness. You have done so much for us in giving your own son to die for our sins. And that changes everything. That changes the way we look at the world around us, the way we, we value our possessions, the way we regard our relationships, the way we fix our hope on things that aren't tied to the moment, but are tied to your promises. And we're so grateful that we have your trustworthy promises regarding all of those things. But Lord, we live in a, we live in a season, and we live in a culture where faith and trust in you is not something that resonates. We don't live in a nation where, where the culture around us is, is encouraging and challenging people to put their trust in you and in your, your promises. And Lord, there are, there's a great need for our faith to be continually strengthened not only for our own soul's sake, but Lord, also for the sake of others that we need to be sharing the truth with. And so we ask you to strengthen us this morning. Help us to see clearly where maybe we have allowed the, um, the thoughts of this world to distort our view of reality. And uh, we will praise you and honor you for whatever you choose to, to clarify in our minds and hearts this morning. And we give you the praise in Christ's name. Amen. Well, the last uh, two out of the last three times I was here, we took a step back to look at a man named Job and to evaluate and to recognize, kind of to see a strategy of how Satan is going about his work of trying to undermine the faith of people that profess to believe in God and put their hope in Him. Um, so today we're going to jump back into that, and uh, we're going to pick up where we left off. We're going to do a little review, because I don't suspect you'll remember um, the full scope of what we covered, and uh, it's a little too broad to go back and review it all, so we're just going to kind of skim it, and then we're going to jump into one more way that we need to be alert about the strategies of our adversary, and the ways that he would seek to undermine our faith and our confidence and trust in, in our Lord. So we're going to start with a, a verse that... I thought, well, might as well start off discouraged, right? <laughs> might as well lay a heavy verse on right off the bat. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 3, the writer of Hebrews, through the Spirit's leading and directing, was warning these people, this group of believers that had gathered together and placed their trust and confidence in Christ. He said, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Because in any group of people... Um, he had a lot of confidence in, this, in the stability and in, this, in the genuineness of the faith of the people that he was writing to. But, but you know, sometimes, sometimes within the hearts of a group of people, there might be one or two people who are entertaining doubts and questions. And their faith and their confidence in the truth of God and what God has revealed is getting a little bit shaky. And there's ramifications and there's, there's uh, consequences that come with that. And so the writer of Hebrews was, was laying out his whole book to try to undergird the confidence that they had that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That He is the one who came to fulfill all of God's promises and purposes. And uh, that they need to entirely put their trust in Him and remain there. Um, so with that being said... Um, this, this concern and this warning is still resonating and still true and I believe still needs to be taught in the church today because some people can be on the verge of abandoning their, in their heart their faith in God and are not aware of the, the drastic ramifications that that has. 
And uh, we need to be honest about those things because even when Jesus was on this earth, there were people who professed to follow him, but to believe in him, and they, they began to follow him, but they didn't finish following him. They, somewhere along the line, encountered some challenge to that faith, and then they turned around and walked away. And so Jesus told those who followed him and to the Jews who believed him, he said, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And an emphasis that Jesus was placing there is this qualifier, if you abide, you are my disciples indeed. And he warned people about the, the danger of beginning something but not finishing it, and that we ought to count the cost. We ought to recognize that there is a cost up front, that walking as a disciple of Christ is not going to be a bed of roses. But it is the truth, and it is the only way of life. And it is the only way to find, to find acceptance with God and to, and to experience the joy and blessings that He has in store for us. And so Jesus warned people that, that one of the things that, that they had to realize is that following Him was something that had to, had to be true of their faith in Him, and they couldn't begin it and then turn their back on Him somewhere down the line and consider and regard themselves to be a disciple of His that is going to be, in, with, going to be fine with no problems. And so this, this concept of abiding... And abiding in His Word is, is central to the reality of what is a true believer. So if we get to, second, to 1 Timothy, that, that concern that Jesus expressed to His followers that, that you can't just begin and then fall away. You need, to, you need to continue being my disciple and to follow through and abide in my Word. That, that's expressed by Paul when he was writing to Timothy because he says this is something that the Holy Spirit has expressly said is going to be a reality um, long term because he says that in the latter time some will depart from the faith. From the faith. And they're going to give heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, and not just listening to it, but then they're going to begin parroting it, and they're going to begin spreading those same lies that they themselves were deceived by, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. Imagine someone who once professed to follow Christ, and now they've been deceived so much that they turn their back on Him, and then they start trying to indoctrinate other people into believing that Jesus Christ is not worth following. And their conscience doesn't even bother them. They can do it without any, without any restraint whatsoever. That is one of the things that, that Paul said is going to be emblematic of the latter times. Because as Satan ratchets up, his, his movement of rebellion against the authority of Christ and authority of God in this world, and he puts his stranglehold over the minds and hearts of people, this is going to be a, a, a more prevalent reality that more and more people are going to be abandoning their faith and they'll be departing from it. If we look at 2 Thessalonians, Paul writes in another place here to the church at this other city, he said, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering to Him, and we're looking towards those latter times and we're kind of seeing the movement of things and we're kind of recognizing that, you know what, Satan is ratcheting up his game plan, but we know that there's an end game to this, right? We know that Jesus Christ is coming. We know that we're going to be with Him. We know that He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords and His kingdom is the one that will last forever and nothing's ever going to come and supplant that. But here we are, and as we're watching this progression and this flow, He says, let no one deceive you by any means... Because that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. There's this going to be a, a discernible and a significant um, falling away of apostasy that people who once professed to believe in Christ are going to turn their back and walk away from Him. And not only walk away from Him, but become, animos, become uh, animated against Him and to try to lead others in that same direction. That is, that is one of the key characteristics that Paul describes as prevalent in the, in the latter times before the Antichrist is kind of the apex or the, the, uh, the high point of Satan's agenda to rebel against God comes to, comes to fruition. So apostasy, this act of refusing to continue to follow, obey, or recognize the faith that one once said that they did. In 1 John... Um, John writes about this. He was looking in his own day, and he was like, you know what, this is, a, this is one of those evidences of the progression of Satan's 
um, movement in the hearts and minds of people to lead them in rebellion, and we're seeing it happen. And so he said, little children, it is the last hour. As you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it's the last hour. We can, we can watch. We may not see the Antichrist yet on the scene, leading the world in, in organized rebellion against God, but what we do see is that whole, that whole spirit of Antichrist is already at work. There are already many that are, that are ant against our Lord and have come to this place. And he says, and where did they come from? Where did they come from? Where did these Antichrists come from? He tells us in the very next verse. They went out from us. They went out from us. Boy, that's sobering. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. Wow, what a sobering thing to think that as the movement of history is going to progress, that within the professing church that professes to believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, that many people are going to turn away, and that many of the Antichrists who run this, around in this world and are trying to persuade other people to turn their back on Christ are those who once themselves profess to believe it. That's sobering. But what about you? John was writing and he said, I have a lot more confidence in the people I'm writing to. He said, but, but you have an anointing from the Holy One and you know all things. It doesn't mean you know it all, but what he's saying is you know the core of the truth. You know the reality that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You know that He's the King of kings and He's the Lord of lords. You know He's the one who came and died on the cross as the punishment for your sin in full, and then He rose again. Hallelujah for the cross, right? Well, you know those things. I have not written to you because you don't know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Therefore, just like Jesus told His disciples that were following Him, the Jews, He said, let my word abide in you. He says, therefore, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. And you can know that that's the, that's the foundation of the relationship, that it is our trust in Him that continues. It doesn't just start, but it continues to the end. And this is the promise that He has promised to us. To who? To the people who abide in His Word and who continue their faith and their trust in Christ as their Lord. He has promised us eternal life. Jesus spoke about this whole dynamic when His disciples had questions about the latter days and when's your kingdom going to come and all these things. And, and Jesus told them, He said, you know, nation's going to rise against nation. Have we seen that? We see that. Kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in various places. Do we see those kinds of turbulent things going on in the world? You know, a lot of times we, we tend to look at external things as, as signs of the times. It was like, wow, there was a, there was a volcano over in the St. What was it, St. Thomas or something the other day that erupted at the first time since 1979. And anyway, we start looking at climactic natural disasters and things of that sort because those are kind of some of the things Jesus mentioned not volcanoes but pestilences and famines and earthquakes and he says all of these are the beginnings of sorrows but you know Jesus began to focus his type his disciples attention on the spiritual signs that are that are even more significant i believe he says then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you and you'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake there's going to be a ratcheted intense opposition to the truth of Jesus Christ throughout this world. And then many will be offended. The NIV translates that as, at that time many will turn away from the faith. And they will betray one another and hate one another. And then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Well, I'm glad that's not happening these days, aren't you? <laughs> We're such a loving country. People loving each other. Isn't that amazing? But, but what's his encouragement? But he who endures to the end shall be 
saved. And what he's not talking, he's not talking about those who physically survive all the bad experiences of the earthquakes and the plagues and the pestilences. What he's saying is those who endure to the end, those who have put their faith in Christ, and in spite of all the trouble that comes, and in spite of all the challenges that come to their faith, they endure in their faith and their confidence that Jesus Christ is who he said he is, and they end with their faith intact, those who endure to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. Well, Jesus spoke about these things. And so therefore the warning is very true and it's very important that brethren, beware lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. As we saw in the life of Job, if you have your Bibles, if you wouldn't mind, turn to the book of Job chapter 1. We look at a... A poor man that uh, went through great, great difficulties in his life. And the foundational basis of this was, was Satan's flaunt in the face of God that man's faith in God is, is very weak. And that all he has to do is apply enough pressure, all he has to do is insert enough problems and enough troubles and people will throw God in the trash can because he's not worth serving. And they will not believe him and trust him. And just as Job's faith came under fire, our faith comes under fire. And we, as we look at Job, we can begin to see Satan's strategies and some of the typical tactics that he uses. He's putting them on display and we ought to have an opportunity here to learn from what God has revealed about him so that we can anticipate the way that Satan thinks he can manipulate people. And if he thought he could do it to Job, then he's going to use similar strategies in his attempts to manipulate and to undermine the faith of you and me and people that we care about and love who profess to believe and trust in Christ. So in Job chapter 1, and starting in verse 6, it says, Now there was a day when the sons of God, speaking of angels, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord, and he said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there's none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? So Satan, I ho you know what, I hope the Lord never points me out to Satan. <laughs> I was like, wow, that's like, it's like whistling. It's whistling to a dog. <laughs> and, and to be honest, I'll... I took a break from this series the last time I was here to preach on something else because I've been going through some stuff and I thought, you know what? I don't want to be like the parrot in the cage that's saying, here, kitty, kitty. <laughs> the last thing I need is to talk about another area that Satan seeks to assault the faith and, and, and uh, alienate people from their heart to God. And I'm not going to set myself up for that. I'm not going to be the parrot saying, here, kitty, kitty. Um, so I taught something different, but now it's like, okay, I'm breathing and I can come back to this. So, But here's... Here's God, and he's saying, look at Job. So Satan answered, and the Lord said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, around all that he has on every side? You've blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. You see Satan's objective in this? I mean, we're, we're going to look at the, the strategies and remind ourselves of the first couple that we talked about when I was here previously. You'll have to dig way back into your video vault um, at your church for your recorded sermons if you want to remember what those were. But Satan's end game, his strategy was to flip Job's faith, to turn him from faith to faithlessness. Because Satan is, a, he is like a roaring lion. Our adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And if you recall watching any of the documentaries about how lions hunt, they, they, they're opportunistic, and they'll crouch, and they'll watch, and they'll look for vulnerability. And they might sit there for hours, and they'll case it out until they find an, an object that they think is vulnerable, and that's where they go for the kill. And Satan's looking for vulnerability. And we need to be prepared for that. We're warned in Ephesians chapter 6 that, that we need to put on the whole armor of God so that we can withstand in the evil day. Because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, 
against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. But thankfully, God has equipped a true believer with everything that we need. And even though we all, who are true believers who desire to live godly in this world, are going to suffer persecution, we have been given all that we need to be able to live godly in this world, Peter says. We've been given the helmet of salvation because we understand that our salvation and our hope comes from our trust in the Savior who died on the cross for our sins and rose again. Right? And so we've been equipped with that. And we know, we know where our salvation comes from. We've been given the gift of righteousness. It doesn't come from us and our good deeds, but the righteousness of Christ, the gift that He's given to us. We've come to understand the truth, and we're no longer deceived by Satan's lies. We're not deceived by the lies of trying to pursue all of the gain that we can in the world and all the, all the gl glamour and the gusto and the fame and the pride. And we're not deceived by thinking that we can accomplish acceptance with God by our own good works. We now know the truth, and the truth has set us free. And it's like that belt that we wear around our waist. And we now have and know and, and cherish the good news that we wear like, like sandals on our feet wherever we go, knowing that Jesus Christ came with good news to save me. And we've been equipped. We've been equipped to be able to go out into our world with the same truth that we wear on our feet every day, with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, which can cut through all the lies that Satan's filtering through other people. And we're like soldiers on the front lines trying to rescue people that are under his control. But the whole time he's assaulting us. And he's trying to undermine that effort that God has put us in. Because Jesus said, upon this truth that Peter said, he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Well, gates are defensive, aren't they? Gates are defensive places that are meant to keep and protect and secure what's kept inside. And Satan has a whole, a whole world full of people whose minds are captive to him and whose hearts are ensnared by the lies that he's taught. And it's your and I's responsibility to go out with the sword of the Spirit, having already been rescued and delivered from Satan's con control in our heart and in our life, and to go out and to try to share that with other people to help rescue them and to deliver them out of his control and out of his power. But in the meantime, we take some hits. Like Job, he's after us, and he's trying to undermine our faith. And if he can take someone who professes to believe in Christ, but yet inside their heart there yet remains an evil heart of unbelief, if he can bring that out, he can turn you away and walk somebody who thought that they were all good in their heart in relating to God, but hadn't really taken true stock and wasn't truly authentically following him and flipped them. And so he launches his fiery darts at us. And so we're told to take the shield of faith and we're given the encouraging promise that but through that shield of faith, we will be able, not we might be able, not we could be able, not that it's just a possibility, but we will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. If he assaults us, we have the ability to withstand. But it's our faith that's going to keep us there. So as he does, and we look at the variety of, of, of assaults that Satan is leveling against Job and that he does against us, then we need to be aware of what these particular avenues of assault can, be, can look like. For Job, the very first one that came about was Satan's assault on his possessions. And so if Satan realized that the very first avenue of assault and attack that I can make on Job to try to turn his heart away from God is on his possessions, then we can expect that that's probably an area that he can, we can expect he'll assault us. And he did that assault with Job. Um, that related to all of his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his camels. I mean, you look at the, the investment of wealth that Job had. He had a diversified portfolio. Why do, we, why do we diversify our investments? Because sometimes one thing's going good and another thing's going what? It's going bad. And Job, Job was a wise investor. And he was a, a wealthy businessman, and he had diversified in lots of different kinds of livestock and trading and activity. But you know what? All the diversification that Job had made to try to provide stability and security for his wealth wasn't anything to insulate him from the assault of Satan. And God gave him permission to tackle him at that point. And in one day, Job went from, from wealth to pennilessness in one day. Well, Jesus has given us instructions that were to help his followers to know how do we view our physical possessions. 
And he tried, to, he tried to help people know that from the beginning because he says, you need to count the cost from the beginning. He had a rich man who came to him and he said, Lord, I want to follow you. What, what do I do? And he said, well, go sell all your possessions, give it to the poor, and then come follow me. And what Jesus was saying is you need to understand you've got to count the cost now because if you don't do it now, you're not going to finish. Because at some point, if you love your material possessions and you love them alongside of me, it can't be done. You cannot love God and money. They cannot be equals in your heart. You're going to have to give one up because sooner or later the choice will be made. You will either say, God can't take that from me or I don't want God. Or you're going to say, you know what? The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And I don't live for something that I can't hang on to and keep anyway. So Jesus gave a lot of instructions about how we're to set our heart, not on things on the earth, but on things in heaven. Not on things that moth and rust corrupt and things break through and steal, but set them where they're, where they're secure and they're safe and put our heart and our hope there. So that gives us a, a perspective as believers, a perspective of faith. That I may suffer great temporary loss now. Maybe Satan's going to put his, his target on me. And maybe this will be an area that he'll assault me in my personal life, where my possessions are going to be ruined and taken away. Maybe my house will be what burns down. Maybe it'll be my car that gets totaled. Maybe it'll be all the, the investments I made that crash in the stock market. But you know what? If it comes at me in that way, I may suffer great temporary loss now, but I've been promised. I've been what? I've been... I've been promised my faith and my hope is in the trustworthy God who's told me what is true. And my, I've been promised greater and lasting gain in the future. And so it's not going to separate me from my trust in Him. And I'm going to continue to trust in Him. And my eggs are still in His basket. So we covered that. The next area that we talked about was Satan takes aiming at our relationships. And with Job, not only did Satan in one day took away all of his possessions materially, but he took away a ton of his relationships. All of his servants that he cared deeply about and had been providing for for years, and every single one of his children in one catastrophic event. And Satan brought about a strong wind and destroyed the house, fell on every one of his kids, and in one day he lost them all. And not only that, but Satan was also at work to use all of those instruments of his assault on Job, and it didn't just hit Job in isolation, it hit his wife too. And that was all it took for her. She eventually told Job, why do you keep your integrity? Why don't you curse God and die? Because I've already given up on God. If God does this to me, why do I want to worship him? Why do I want to follow him? We talked about the reality that Jesus spoke of that, you know what, following him can cause, it can cost us in our relationships. It can. It can cost us maybe because Satan might target one of our loved ones that we love catastrophically in some kind of an accident or, or some kind of a, a terrible thing that, that occurs in their life. Or it could come about because maybe he'll turn their heart away from God and he'll make that relationship that we have with them conditioned on that. Just, just last week, my heart ached when I heard someone I care about talk about someone in their family, an adult, uh, a young adult married um, niece, who declared to her parents that she's now bisexual, though she's married, and knowing that that's incompatible with the truth of what she's been raised with in the Christian church, has renounced her faith in Jesus, and made endorsement and affirmation of her new declaration of lifestyle the condition on their continued relationship with her. And so what it is stands now is she won't talk with them. She won't. She's, she's just basically blathered it all out to them, just laid everything on the line, said all kinds of hurtful things, and is trying to now steer the heart of another sibling away from their parents. It's hard. And Jesus said, sometimes following me means that you're going to have to love me more than your father and your mother and your children. Because sometimes that animosity that builds up in people's hearts related to me, it comes from within your own family. And that will be more and more the case as the latter times progress. So we talked about that last time. And Jesus gave us perspective on that. He told his disciples, no one has left anything, <laughs> houses or lands or, or uh, fields or family, father, mother, children. They've never given up anything where he says, I will not give you a hundredfold more in this life and eternal life in the end. 
So here's our, here's our faith promise. Here's what we can hold up that gives us the ability to withstand if Satan assaults us in that area. I may lose family and friends that I dearly love, but Jesus promised me a hundredfold more along with eternal life. So those were the first two areas that we looked at as Satan begins to take aim at believers. And the third area we're going to look at today is Satan as he takes aim at Job in the, in the arena of his health. So we're going we're gonna to look at this and uh, maybe open a can of worms. I hope it won't be, but I hope it'll just be kind of a perspective moment for us. But Job chapter 1, or chapter 2, the first avenues of Satan's assault on Job haven't been successful because Job's faith in, Jesus, faith in God is authentic. He knows him. He knows him, and, and he's, he's not willing to sacrifice it on, the, on account of difficulties that come from material losses or losses of people that he loves. So in chapter 2, verse 1, it says, Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, From whence do you come? Satan answered the Lord, and he said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? This is why I say, I hope the Lord never points me out <laughs> to him, because it's almost like saying, Here, kitty, kitty. Have you considered my servant Job, that there's none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil, and still he holds fast his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without a cause? Satan's next strategy comes to the forefront. He says to the Lord, skin for skin. Yes, all that a man has, he'll give for his life. But stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he'll surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took for himself a potsherd with which to scrape himself while he sat in the midst of the ashes. Job was such a mess, his friends came when they heard about his condition and they saw him and they didn't even recognize him. They sat unable to even know what to say for a week. If we read through the book of Job, we see the, just the physical calamity and the struggle as it was wearing on him. And it was a, it was a brutal, brutal experience that Job went through. But what I want us to pay attention to and notice here is that Satan has the ability to affect us in a physical way. He was the one who afflicted Job with the boils in his body. Now, I can't tell you I understand how that works. A scientist can sit down and he can tell you how a, how a, a virus attacks your system and gets in and penetrates it and, and begins to wreak havoc in your body. And we can talk about the scientific things that go on, but how does Satan do what he, do, what he does? I mean, how does he manipulate the minds of individual people, groups, and leaders so that they, they're all coordinated to attack one person on one day in totally different arenas. How does Satan manage and coordinate that kind of control over people's minds and hearts? How does Satan conjure up uh, a fierce wind that can blow a house down? How does he manage tornadoes or straight line winds and that kind of force? I don't know. I mean, that's not a realm that I've got a, a handbook on that tells me this is how he does it. But I do have a book that tells me that, that he was the one who did it, right? So we know he has that kind of capability. We know he has that power. It is within the realm and sphere of his ability to affect our lives. And it was with Job, and he was the one who afflicted Job from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head with these painful boils. Now, with all that said, what I want to do is I want to just kind of skim through some New Testament things that kind of reveal to us the the ability of spiritual forces of wickedness and the power they have to affect people's physical condition. Okay? And I, and I don't, I'm not going to, this is not a, a documentary about how, how demons work and exorcism and, and all these kinds of things work, but I want us to see and make this connection that Satan and the forces of evil that he directs have the ability to affect us in physical ways. Are we there? Okay, we're just going to allow that, allow the scripture to speak for itself, to help us realize that Satan can take aim at our health. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 6, seen, 
It says that when evening had come, they brought to him, brought to Jesus, many that were demon, that were what? Demon possessed. And he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. So if we just read this verse alone, you would say, wait a minute. Is there a correlation here? It sounds as if there's a correlation that these demonic oppression and possession of people was associated with the sickness that they were experiencing. Well, that might be a little obscure. So let's look at some that are a little bit more direct and clear. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 22, one was brought to him who was demon-possessed, blind and mute. And he healed him so that the blind and mute both spake and spake and saw. So here in this individual's life, there was a demon that was creating the physical inability to see and to hear. And when Jesus dealt with the spiritual demon that was involved, the physical malady ended. Here's another one in Luke chapter 9. Now it happened on the next day when they had come down from the mountain that a great multitude met him. And suddenly a man from the mountain cried out, saying, Teacher, I implore you, look on my son, for he's my only child. And behold, a spirit seizes him. A what? A spirit seizes him. And he suddenly cries out, and it convulses him, so that he foams at the mouth, and it departs from him with great difficulty, bruising him. In Matthew 17, he, he described it, saying, He often tries to destroy him by throwing him into the fire, and often into the water. <coughs> He said, so I implored your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. And he was still, as he was still coming, the demon threw him down and convulsed him. And then Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the child, and gave him back to his father. So we read these kinds of things and we say, okay, there's some physical things that maybe we, we see in our world and recognize with as, and we can put labels on what this particular malady is. And it sounds like this child was going through grand mal seizures. But the cause of it, behind it, in this particular child's life was, was, demon, was demon caused. It was, a, it was an evil spirit. Now, before, you, before anybody goes too far with what I've covered so far, somebody might say, well, Tim, are you saying that everybody who's blind is demon-possessed? Are you trying to say that everybody who experiences grand mal seizures is demon-possessed? No, I'm not saying that. What are we saying at this point? That demons have the power to affect people in their physical health. And in these particular circumstances, we see that. Let's go on just a little further. Peter, when he was talking to Cornelius and sharing with him the gospel, recounted to him things that Cornelius had already heard, the, the, the news that was spread and well known that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the, by the devil, for God was with him. And here's another example, and I love this one, because this one, I think, helps us get a better glimpse of how Satan is actually at work in ways that we sometimes don't give him credit and we don't realize the spiritual, the spiritual challenges that are intended to go with it. In Luke chapter 13, as Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath day, behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity. It's an interesting phrase, isn't it? She had a what? A, a spirit of infirmity. 18 years. And was bent over and could in no way raise herself up. If you, if you look at kind of the physical dilemma that this is being described as, it's, it, it sounds like kyphosis, which is um, damage to the, to the vertebrae, which causes you to be hunched over. You've heard of the hunchback of Notre Dame, where you're hunched over and, and you can't raise yourself up. And this is something that often, that, that's more prevalent in older women than with men. But So here's this woman for 18 years, she's plagued with this and she's stooped over, she cannot straighten up. When Jesus saw her, he called her to him and he said to her, Woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. And he laid his hands on her. And immediately she was made straight and glorified God. And I get what happens with the religious ruler. The ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. And so he says to the crowd, he's like, okay, this is enough. 
we got a lady here who's come here with a physical malady, and she's gotten healed on the Sabbath. So he's, he starts addressing the rest of the crowd, and he says, There are six days on which men ought to work. Therefore, come and be healed on them, and not on the Sabbath day. If any of you other people think that you're going to come in here and get healed today, then change your plans, because it's not going to happen today. Come another day. It's like, what in the world? It's amazing, the, the straining at gnats and swallowing camels that sometimes we can go through. And it just bewildered Jesus. He's, the Lord answered him. He said, hypocrite. Does not each one of you on the Sabbath day loose his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead it away to water? So ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham whom, whom Satan has what? Whom Satan has bound. Think of it. For 18 years be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath? And when he had said these things, his adversaries were put to shame. And all the multitude rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. And you know what? It says it's talking about the glorious things that were done by him. I have a feeling she wasn't the only person who got delivered from the oppression that she was going through. I have a feeling that there were other people in the crowd that day that ended up coming and being healed on the Sabbath. Now what I want us to notice from this experience that this woman was going through, it does not say that she was demon possessed, does it? doesn't say she was demon. She wasn't a lunatic. She was a, somebody's grandma who had been struggling and suffering for years, hobbling into church, hunched over and unable to straighten herself up. And Jesus said that Satan had her, what? He had her bound. Jesus attributed what was going on in her physical life as an arena where Satan was trying to injure her and restrain her and keep her in check. So what are we saying? If we let the, spirit, the scriptures just speak for themselves, we can say this. We know Satan has power to affect our physical bodies, does he not? We know that demons have that ability because we see the types of things that, were, that people that were afflicted by demon possession experienced. But even if you throw demon possession out, which is not something hopefully that we encounter on a, on a regular basis among people that we know, but even as we just experience the physical dilemmas that we go through in our lives, when our bodies are affected in ways that really try us and break us down and put us on our, on our backs... That in that arena, it is a very real possibility that Satan is using it to try to target our faith. Are you with me? Am I, I'm, I'm not stretching that too far. I'm just trying to let the Spirit say what it says right here. That this was something that Satan was using in this woman's life to bind her. And with that being said, as we look at all that Jesus was doing... He was doing a lot. I mean, many were demon-possessed. He cast out the spirits with a word. He healed all who were sick. And he was doing it in fulfillment of Scripture, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, He himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. And I was interesting when you guys read your verse for the month. And it came right from Isaiah 53. It says, Surely he's borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Hallelujah for the cross. He died to rescue and deliver and to save us from our sin fully and entirely. And we look at this last part of the verse and by his stripes we are healed. And you know what? That verse has been the downfall of many people's faith. Because in that verse, people have pinned their hopes on this, that Jesus Christ died to save me from my sin and to give me eternal life. And he died to take away all of my sicknesses and all of my diseases. And all I have to do is trust Him for it. I don't have to live under any ailments. He's already paid the price for that. I'm free. That's hard to say when you're running 107 fever. That's hard to say when you can't breathe in a hospital because you got COVID like Greg did, right? It's hard. 
So what is Jesus saying here? Is he saying that we've been given a get out of sickness pass from the moment we trust Christ as our Savior? No, Christ, Christ has a full package for us, does he not? He's got a full package of salvation and redemption, but that full package isn't complete just yet. It isn't fulfilled just yet. And we see that in the life of the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And for those who, who want to believe that Jesus' sacrifice on the cross gives us instant healing now from all of our diseases, and I never should be sick a day in my life, then we're going to have to recalibrate that kind of a belief to accommodate the truth that Scripture says that Satan is an adversary who attacks us in the realm of our health. And that Paul was one person who followed Christ, and he was given a thorn in the flesh that was given to him a messenger of Satan to buffet him. And I know some people have taken this terminology of thorn in the flesh as a metaphor, kind of like, you know what, sometimes my, my teenager is my thorn in the flesh. You know, we understand what that means. It's, my, it's, my, it's a point of, of pain and, and difficulty. And some people think, well, maybe this is just a figure of speech Paul was using, a metaphor to talk about some other struggle going on in his life. It wasn't necessarily a physical one. But Paul, as he's talking here, listen to the way he describes this thorn in the flesh, this messenger of Satan to, to beat him up, lest I be exalted above measure. God had a purpose for this. And God allowed it to happen because he didn't want Paul to be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelations. He knew that this could be a source of pride for Paul. It could be a source by which maybe people would look at Paul too highly. And so concerning this thing, after, after he's been given this thorn in the flesh, he pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from him. It, it wasn't just a problem. It was something he, he, he was experiencing continually. And he's pleading with the Lord for removal. Have you ever had that kind of thing going on? Have you ever been so desperate that you're just like, God, I can't do this. I can't go on like this. I need you. I need you to take this away. I can't, I can't handle it. And the Lord said to, to Paul, he said, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. In other words, Jesus said, no. No. I'm not taking it away, Paul. There's a purpose for this. And you're just going to have to trust me. You're just going to have to rely on me. You're just going to have to continue to abide in your trust in me and hang on and trust my grace to get you through because this is something that's, that's necessary. Therefore, most gladly, Paul says, I'll rather boast in my infirmities. That's the same terminology of sicknesses or, or ailments that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and in reproaches and needs and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Paul understood that he was going through this and it was persecution, wasn't it? It was a thorn in the flesh and it didn't come from a person. It didn't come from a group of people. It wasn't coming, it didn't happen when he was in jail. It wasn't some Roman magistrate. It was just a physical problem that came on him in full force, and it was devastating to Paul. But he understood that the source of it was a spiritual assault on him physically, and he understood that it was what? Persecution. I used to read the verse that, this verse that says, All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. I was like, yeah, that doesn't apply to me. I live in America. They'll never throw me in jail. I used to always think that's what persecution is. It's going to jail for your faith. Persecution is being ridiculed in public for your faith. Persecution is having your house and your wealth taken away, or being fired from your job, not being allowed to do, and started thinking about all these things that happen in other countries. But the reality is persecution comes from an adversary, right? And it can come to us in the realm of our physical health. And it might just be something that you can diagnose at the doctor's office, but behind it... I don't know in every circumstance, but I know in some, certainly Satan is in that process and he's seeking to undermine our faith and turn our hearts away from God. If God let this happen to me and he has the power to heal it and he doesn't, then why do I keep following him? Why do I keep trusting him? You know, Satan whispers those thoughts in our heads. Whether it's weakness, infirmities, reproaches, needs, persecutions, distresses, Paul's like, man, my, my list is getting longer all the time. But I'm going to keep trusting. 
So how do we have faith in that, in that context? Well, let's think about our physical bodies really quickly. Our citizenship isn't here, right? We're like Abraham looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. His foundation is not made by man. Our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior. We're waiting because we know that when He comes, well, then things change, right? And so right now, He isn't here, but we're waiting and we're eagerly waiting for the Lord Jesus Christ who will... He hasn't yet, but He what? He will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to His glorious body, according to the working by which He's able even to subdue all things to Himself. And so you know what? Knowing that truth that when Jesus comes, He's going to make that transformation in our suffering and in our pain and all that we're going through, that one day when He comes, we will be transformed in our bodies and we won't be dealing with the mess that we have now. That gives us perspective. That, my beloved and long for brethren, that he gives us my joint crown. So stand what? Stand fast in the Lord. Don't let that struggle in your physical afflicted body tear your faith off from Christ so that you want to turn away and walk away. Stand fast. In 1 Corinthians, Paul describes this lowly body that's going to be transformed. He says, when this corruptible has put on incorruption... And this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. See, Jesus Christ has been victorious over sin and death and hell when he was on the cross. But there's going to come a time when we're going to experience it. And that's when we'll be able to say, yes, it has all been swallowed up in victory. Everything that death has to throw at me. So we can, we can say with a with a little bit of cockiness in our heart, at least, maybe not in our body, but to say, oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? You're going to have to throw more at me than that. Because I know the truth. I know that the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I know he's done this. And I'm just waiting for it. I'm waiting for it. And I'm going to continue to wait and to endure and to hold on. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be what? Be steadfast. Be immovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You are not trusting Christ in vain. You are not serving Him in vain. He has got this all covered. And in the end, your hope and your trust in His promises will be honored. I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God was with men. This is John as he's writing, as he's seeing what's going to happen in the end. He says that he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself will be with them and will be their God. Wasn't well, that the day we long for? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Boy, what a day that'll be. And listen to what he says. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more what? No more pain. For the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. You can, you can take it to the bank. This is what, I've got, this is what I'm going to do. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes. He who what? Overcomes. overcomes. That means going through life and enduring the onslaught of whatever Satan might throw at our way, however it comes, whether it's our wealth that gets taken away, our relationships or our health. And as we're going to see in the next verse, even in the next installment of this message, probably next year, as he attacks our reason and our inability to sort out all that God's doing and the confusion that comes with it, he who overcomes shall inherit all things. And I will be his God and he shall be my son. So, our shield of faith says this. I may have to endure physical suffering now. It's not going to be all just name it and claim it. I can't just, I can't just wish away all the things that I'm, my body's going through. And I can't just say it's all going to go away because Jesus died on the cross and by His stripes I'm healed. It's not going to happen that way. It's going to happen when He returns and I'm caught up to be with Him and I receive that transformation process that he's stored up. I may endure physical sufferings now, but I am promised a new body that will what? Never experience pain, sickness, or death. And so whatever I'm going through right now, I can look at it this way. Therefore, we do not lose heart. 
Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. And it gives us the ability to look at our moment and the struggles that we go through this way for our light affliction. How many of you could say that about whatever you're going through physically now? Is it light? Or is it getting heavier by the moment? But you know what? When we keep our perspective right, we can look at it and say, you know what? In the long scope of things, I know I can look by faith now at what I'm going to say later, that this is a light affliction, which is but for a what? It's but for a moment. It is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we don't look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take him at his word. Just to trust his promises, right? He loves you. He's got you. And he's got that all covered in the plan. It's just a time of enduring and waiting and abiding. God bless you as you do that. Let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Father, we thank you for you love us. Thank you that you have given us everything we need to be able to withstand the onslaught of our enemy. And there are some things about this that are just mysterious to us. We don't, we don't fully grasp at what level and degree you have given Satan or the evil spirits that live in rebellion to you. Well, we don't understand to what degree you've given them latitude to afflict our bodies. But we do know this, that it's harder to trust you when we struggle and suffer physically. So Lord, I pray for your dear people here in this room today that as they go through life, if they begin to feel these weights and these burdens, things that maybe they cry out to you repeatedly asking you to take it away, I pray that you would help them know your grace is sufficient for them. I ask you to help them to remember your promises that give them hope and that they would cling to that, and that they would draw near to you, and that in the end that you would be able to say to Satan, have you considered my servant who still believes and trusts in me? Thank you, Lord, for giving us all those promises, for helping us see through the truth, for seeing reality as it is, and help us, help us to be strong, strong inwardly, even if we're weak outwardly. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.